All right, we'll get started here. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, really important topic given the current times. Uh, just a, a reminder, we will be recording this and we'll be sharing the presentation and recording um, later today or tomorrow morning. Uh, you can find all of our past webinars on our YouTube channel. Um, so feel free to peruse uh, past topics. And um, also there you can subscribe to get notified when we post new webinars. Um, with that out of the way, I'll turn it over to Steve Scheinkoff, our CEO, to talk about how to buy appliances during a supply crisis. Thank you, Pat, and thank you everybody for joining us on another lovely 11 o'clock here on Thursday. How to buy appliances, pretty much, this is gonna be pretty much about anything that's home improvement because I think most everything home improvement's got some sort of crisis. So with that in mind, let's begin. On the left, we have Freddy Krueger. On the, in the middle, we've got Jason from Friday the 13th. And on the right, we've got Michael Myers. Not Mike Myers, the actor, Michael Myers from Halloween fame. They're all fictional. However, the appliance supply chain, is, the, the horror of the appliance supply chain is very real. We're going to get into that. First, I want to tell you how, I'll give you a couple of stories of really where we're at in terms of, uh, of what you can expect and what people are saying. And we're going to start with Bosch. And I'm not picking on Bosch by any means. They're, they're not, by far, they're not the worst of all the people. But um, their, their CEO went on their website and uh, did something really courageous, uh, apologized for the lack of availability of his product. And in reality, um, his production was cut 25 to 50%. So that was about four or five months ago. Now, the local territory managers, man named Barry Reef, were kind of friendly. Um, we go to lunch often, and he was insistent that we go to lunch. So go to lunch, go to Deeds in Stoughton for all of you on the uh, South Shore there. Um, we go to Deeds, and he says to me, you know, uh, we're going to have to cut your program. We're going to have to cut your, uh, your allocation by 25 to 50%. And I go, is that in addition to the 25 to 50% was already cut? He goes, yeah. So depending on what how you fractionate, um, we have overwhelming demand and we have a fraction of what it is we actually need to, um, to supply that demand. At the same time, there is success out there. And I'll tell you a story about Jenny. I'll call her Jenny because that's her real name. I drop off my child uh, every uh, three times a week at her uh, preschool. And about a year ago, she said to me, she goes, you sell appliances. I said, yeah. She goes, well, what do you think's good? And I go, well, there's no one good thing for any, you know, how you cook, how much space do you have? You know, all the questions I'm going to get into later here. And, um, and over a year, we've been talking, you know, five minutes of time about our kitchen. So it's September this year. Um, she asked me, she had a quote. She go, well, there's two things you might want to consider. You know, prices are increasing. Now the lead times are 12 to 14 months for some of the things that you're, um, you're considering. So about three weeks ago, about two weeks ago, she said, you know, I bought stuff from you and I was expecting what I normally get is, can you get my stuff sooner? I got the contract coming in next week. But she goes, you know, really wasn't all that bad. And the meal of dishwasher is, they quoted me March on. I'm like, March, that was a, a product I used to be able to deliver in a day and install the next day. She goes, Sub-Zero is a little, you know, it's a little out there. It's uh, end of May. And here it is in the end of September to give you the idea. But then she said the magic word. She goes, I don't really need it. I don't even have a kitchen or a contractor yet. So really success is now is how do you plan? If you know that some of the stuff that you may want is a year out, how do you plan for that? And we're going to go into that a lot. Now I had to get it right with Jenny because she exerts undue influence on my five-year-old. That's my five-year-old raising a hand saying, take care of Jenny. So here's what we're going to do. We've already talked about the problems of Bosch and how to succeed. We're going to talk about what the issues are. We talk about appliance store issues uh, that you may not have thought about. We talk about the appliance, hardest appliances to buy right now. And, the, and at the same time, we talk about some, if you're really looking between now and say six months, there are some good available brands to consider. We're going to talk about planning your kitchen. Then we're going to talk about planning your kitchen without a kitchen like Jenny did. And for that, I'm going to say what the most common appliance sizes, so you can plan your own. And then we'll talk, if you need something immediately, we're going to talk about some 
really unusual ways to get, a, you know, a decent appliance that you may not have thought of um, in, in, in kind of a unique way. So I think you'll really enjoy the last part, especially. So let's get into it. As Pat said, these are the uh, past webinars. Ones I recommend is how to start your kitchen, you know, the 12 kitchen renovations, mistakes to avoid, five ways to make your kitchen unique. Uh, those are all good. And as we've said before in all the webinars, construction is really when you look at it, when you look at it, it's designing, scheduling, selection, and then close up. We're going to handle all three, uh, uh, the top three today. So you're going to do a little bit of everything. With that in mind, let's talk about manufacturing problems, right? Um, I would say that COVID last year, because none of us had a manual on it, um, hit everybody as a surprise. And so far as if we look at March of last year, Nobody was buying anything. So factories shut down. And then sometime around May, June, everyone you know, looked around their house and started to make home improvements. So you had overwhelming demand um, against short supply because factories now had its new OSHA guidelines for social distancing. Um, they had employee issues in certain ways of people that didn't want to work because they were afraid of getting um, you know, COVID. You had, you had certain um, issues in terms of um, the supply chain in that way in, in direct regards to COVID. Now we're talking about key component issues like computer chips. You can't get an F-150 now because there's not enough chips. Um, also, one of the real interesting things is that, uh, you know, I was talking to someone from Sub-Zero uh, yesterday, actually. And he's like, insulation. He goes, all the insulation is now made in Louisiana and Dallas. And Dallas, of all places, had a freeze. And, two, and then this year it had, I guess, two hurricanes that it had knocked out the plant. So all these domestic refrigerator manufacturers don't have insulation put in their in refrigerators. And when you overlay all this stuff over almost a year and a half, and then you add overwhelming demand, you're talking about very shaky supply. And these are, this, is, this is what we're, what we're talking about. You know, in, in 2019, it was a one to four week lead time. Even less in dishwashers, you can get them the next day. We still have next day delivery. But these are the brands that are now quoting four to 14 months. And I would say uh, of these Samsung, I, I really haven't seen much of. Uh, Sub-Zero Wolf is, I would say, is about a year out. Um, certain Meal is nine months out. Uh, Bosch is four months at least out. Um, so that's what we're looking at. Um, four to 14 months average lead time on most appliances. And at the same time, what's made it worse is appliance store problems. The way a product used to come in was a steady flow of appliances. They, they used to kind of used to make a dock appointments, they'd come in. This is um, one of our warehouses in Stoughton. Now, the supply chain is just so um, erratic that you get a call saying you have five months of inventory that you're looking at, they need to take right away or they're going to give it to somebody else. So now a lot of um, retailers, including myself, I've, I've, we operate up until this year out of 100,000 now operating out of 150,000 square feet. And we're, we're putting a new warehouse together that's 235,000 square feet that we hope will accommodate everything. And at the same time, warehousing is, has gone up six times since we bought our first warehouse in 2011. And there's no space because Amazon and all the e-commerce people have taken it all. So it's a real problem that even if the product comes in to your retailer, there could be a problem in them actually accepting. These are the hardest appliances to buy. Refrigeration, um, we wrote a post uh, about the best 33 inch uh, refrigerators and it could have been a simple post saying there are none. So it turns out there's only one that you can get which is Fisher Paco. Refrigerator has their quad that's, that's not really popular. Some of the other ones, compact laundry. Um, Meal and Bosch are both not in manufacturing until, are not shipping fully until March of next year. Dishwashers professional ranges, special orders now, uh, real problems, okay? But if there's problems now, there's, there's, we have to give you some solutions so you won't fret so much. If there's a big winner in all this, it's LG, and they've supplied okay, which means they've supplied fantastic throughout the pandemic. And we were always more inclined to sell Samsung, but seeing Samsung hasn't really been able to supply anything. LG is actually a really good line that we need to pay more attention to. They've got the studio line, the signature line. They have the uh, door and door refrigerators. They've got uh, 
They have the 6.3 cubic foot, one of the largest ovens you can buy. The dishwashers use steam. It's a very interesting line of appliances that's available. So maybe you're not, maybe you, won't, you can't buy a Bosch kitchen set um, or say GE kitchen, but LG is a good substitute for that. And one of the pro ranges that you should be looking at, and, and Saba can talk more, to the, uh, more about this towards the end of our presentation. This is their line called SKS. You're looking at a range that's got sous vide on the left, 23,000 23, BTU burners in the middle, um, along with 215s, making one of the most powerful ranges. And induction on the right-hand side. Induction is the fastest and best simmer. The oven is, the oven is convection. The side oven is actually a steam oven, and it's all powered by Wi-Fi. That seems to work. They were one of the first to do it in their ThinQ app. So maybe you don't get a uh, maybe a Thermidor or perhaps a Wolf, or maybe you can't wait. This is a, a pretty interesting alternative to that. Fisher Pickell may be another one as well. So probably the luckiest line I've ever carried is this one is is Beko. As everybody was having problems, they were importing they were importing appliances into the United States. Their dishwasher, when you talk about quiet, the minimum threshold for quietness is 44 decibels. Theirs is 39. It has special arms for scrubs. It's got special cycles. It's got, these have ion generators that pulse negative ions to cancel out the positive ions of, uh, of smell. It sounds gimmicky, but it actually works. Um, the refrigerator has got blue lighting and an ethylene filter to, um, to keep food fresher longer. We tested it along with five other manufacturers uh, over a four week uh, period with fruit and vegetable. They were number two to sub, only to sub zero. And the, and the product seems to work. So this is a line that you may not have considered, and certainly we didn't before a year and a half ago. It's got interesting product, reasonably priced, good features that you can buy now. G has problems in the regular line, but the better lines, Cafe, um, which allows you to customize, you're looking at, uh, white with uh, copper handles, you get brass or stainless steel, you get black, you get stainless, you can, you can mix, mix and match handles. Um, they've done a nice job keeping that and they're, and they're better profile line as well. KitchenAid has been good up until this month. KitchenAid of course is the uh, premier line of the Whirlpool Corporation and they've done a nice job keeping the products online. They have good dishwashers, surprisingly good ovens as well. So if you're planning a kitchen, one year in advance, you should be good with almost any brand. And for, when I say almost, get into specialty and some of the other ones, you wanna get your store to put a PO in and you wanna get an e estimated ETA. If it's close to a year, it's probably gonna be over a year. If you're zero to six months in advance, um, then I would say KitchenAid, LG, Cafe, True, uh, which is a, a really interesting professional uh, Refrigerator, Blue Star, an interesting professional range. Mila doesn't have dishwasher, we get a pro range for them. Pretty interesting. You get a dual field 48, but you can't get a dishwasher. Echo, as we mentioned in SQS. Okay, so let's take what Jenny did and, and, and let me tell you how to plan your kitchen without a kitchen. So you can order your stuff now, then have your kitchen plan. So you'll be way ahead of the now, here's how you start. You start at your sink. I know that's kind of unusual for an appliance person to say start at your sink, but it's really where the, it's really the most used appliance in your kitchen, is your sink. Think about it. And you're either going to put it under a window or you're going to put it in an island. I put mine in an island. You start there. Then you want to centralize your sink, stovetop, and dishwasher. Those are the, those are the three most used appliances in your kitchen, especially your stovetop. You're always stirring, right? You know, you're putting something on there, you're tethered to it. Now, your biggest decision is going to be, you have a couple of decisions. We're getting a secondary cooking in a second. Your biggest decision is wall oven in cooktop or a range. Now, the range has to be centralized because you're stirring. But when you think about it, wall ovens and refrigerators can be placed anywhere. It's not mission critical for you to check the turkey every 30 seconds. And you never really have to be into your refrigerator. So keep that in mind is centralizing sink, stove top and dishwasher. And then the biggest decision being, is your kitchen going to be wall of a cooktop or is it going to be range? That's really the only decision that's gonna change the whole overall flow of your kitchen. 
that one right there. Now, to make, this, to make this easy, to tell you that it's much easier than you think it is, appliances follow cabinets, not the other way around. Now you're looking at the real, the most common appliance sizes there is. You have 24 inch dishwasher, 30 inch range, which you can buy in a number of different configurations. Quarter inch microwaves, 30 inch refrigerators, 36 inch. Now we say it's 30, 24, and 36, really referring to the cabinet. Refrigerators 35 and typically in a half or three quarters. Now notice I didn't say that's a 38 inch refrigerator or a 28 inch stove or a 22 inch dishwasher because those cabinets don't exist. Standard cabinets, as you find out, we look at stoves. Stoves are the most common size 30 inch, right? 20 and 24 are more of the apartment size. 30 is the most common. 36, 48, 60 inch cabinets, you know, refer to the ranges. Those are the, those are the bigger professional types or the, the bigger ranges that look like professional types. Going to Walden's and cooktops. If you look straight ahead, that's a 30 inch Gaggano wall oven. It's not 30 inches wide if it's 30 inch cabinet. Now that is the most common size. The other sizes are 24. Those are the older European and very old gas models. 27, which was the standard when I started here 35 years ago. 30, which I just mentioned. And underneath that cooktop, if you look at it, it's 36. Those are Wolf, Gaggenau, Viking, have the 36. Those aren't really common. Cooktop sizes are 12 inch modules, 15 inch modules, 24 inch. You've got a smaller European size, but 30 and 36 are the cooktop mm -hmm. sizes. Now, range tops are totally different. They're 24, 30, 36, 48, and 60, but they all fit the cabinets. And because these terms are used so interchangeably and it's so wrong, okay? The difference between a cooktop is really think of it as the top of a stove. A range top is the top of a range. Now there's a big difference, not just in output, size, simmer, options, grill, griddle, is the big difference in this is that the cooktop is mounted on the countertop. The range top is mounted on the cabinet. And that's not something you want to like figure out at moment of delivery. So that's the difference. Range top is top of pro, cooktop is top of the stove. Refrigeration, as we mentioned, 36 inch. You're looking at all 36 inch refrigerators in the picture. Other sizes are 18, 24. Typically uh, 28 would be another one. 30, we've got 33 inch, 42 and 48 inch sizes. So it's 18, 24, 28, 30, 33, 42, 48. Now, if you're, if you're planning a new kitchen, typically it's gonna be 36. If it's an apartment, it's gonna be 30. If it's a larger, it's gonna be uh, 42 or 48. Now the 18s and 24s, those are typically, uh, you would uh, match them together. Those are the new kind of integrated types. They're 24 and 18 to, to, to fit a 42 inch cap. Dishwashers are easy. Uh, they're almost always 24 inch. A few apartment types are 18. Okay. Now the other, the other, the other item you have to figure out for yourself is what secondary appliances you need to use. And I could put steam ovens and speed ovens in there and where they go. If you have an island, you've got plenty of opportunity to put everything. But really, look at refrigerator drawers, 24, 30. Microwave drawers, 24 and 30. Beverage centers, 15 and 24. Speed ovens are 24 and 30. You know, when you talk about secondary cooking, secondary refrigerator, where does that fit in the overall plan? If it's a microwave, if you use a microwave a lot, do you put it at, at, over, say, a single oven? If you don't use it a lot, like I do, do you put it somewhere else in, the, um, in, in your kitchen? Chopping vegetables, you put a secondary refrigerator underneath that or, or something for your kids to get into so not in the main refrigerator. Those are the considerations that you need to think about before you're uh, planning your kitchen. And here's, here's one thing, you know, we've been doing webinars for, I don't know, I mean, it's, Pap could probably tell how many after this. I think it's somewhere around eight and nine. And our first one is how to plan an outside kitchen. I'm like, and I didn't really know as much about outside as inside. And one of the best pieces of advice I got was, when you look at a big space is, chalk it off. Really, if you go into the space, chalk it off. If you're in an existing space, obviously, and you're demolishing a kitchen, or even if uh, you're going into a, you know, you're moving into a new space, you're putting a new kitchen in, is figure out what you need 
and then chalk it off and make believe you're actually cooking or, or planning a meal and see how it all flows, where the secondary cooking is, where the sink should be, where the, uh, where, where the wall of a refrigerator can be, and then tape it off and see how that works. I thought that was an interesting piece of advice. A lot of people have used it like that. So something to consider. But again, don't make this harder than it is. Figure out the wall and cooktop. You know, group, group those three together. Figure out what the secondary is. And everything else is just basic measurements. It's just fitting um, square pegs and square holes, if you were. But what if you need it now? Right? So here's some unusual. Here's a couple unusual observations. Let's take a look at the Bosch dishwasher that we have. Right. If you are intent on a Bosch dishwasher set, just know that there's five different, there's six different series, and each one of these series has a number of different styles. Whether it's regular front control, integrated pocket handle, towel bar, or we could even put a, a panel on some of them. So most appliance stores don't know what they have. So let's just say you're looking for, you know, 500 series Bosch. Can you get it in a regular integrated pocket handle towel bar? and call all the stores and see if they have one, I think you may find that you have about a 50% shot, which is better than most people will quote you, of getting a product that you want, maybe in a different maybe in a different style. Same thing with Miele. Miele's got three. KitchenAid's got three. Um, a lot of these companies will, will put different model numbers that really have the same type of, um, that will have the same type of feature package. Uh, so figure out what it is you want, and then, and then, and then look to buy the brand that you want. But there's a better way of doing it, right? Like most people say they want a Bosch dishwasher and I love Bosch and I, and I hope, uh, and I'm not picking on it by any means. Uh, they're average in terms of uh, shipping, which is better than they think they are. So really is what the driver and the purchase is typically in a Bosch is stainless steel and quiet. Well, if you're looking for a stainless steel and quiet dishwasher, say interior, Kitchen has got a 39 decibel dishwasher that has been available throughout the pandemic. It's thousand dollars, very similar to the Bosch. Beko has a 39 decibel with Wi-Fi control scrubs uh, at eight ninety nine. LG has one for about thousand dollars too. Can you switch from a Bosch or KitchenAid or any of the brands that you're looking at? Really dial down to the features that you're looking for, and then buy the available brand that has those features. That's, if you were to get, if you were looking for a KitchenAid, you end up with a Bosch, we'd make the comparisons. If you're looking for a Mila and you get a Bosch, if you're getting a, looking for Mila and getting a Beko, if you're looking for a Beko, getting KitchenAid, I think over time you're gonna find out you'd be happy with any major reliable brand. As long as it fits whatever your specifications are. Let me introduce you to the two happiest guys in appliances. These are all, Right. So the way it works is if you schedule delivery with, with us, what we do is we give you the um, dimensions of everything that you buy. We will call you um, and text you uh, about your delivery and time. We'll send you a video of what to expect on delivery. And then you track the truck right to our house. But even if we've taken as many fail safes as we can, but even, even so, say we do two to 250 deliveries a day. There's gonna be a couple that come back because they won't fit. Um, if you live in the south end of Mass, the landings, you live in the south end, I'm sorry, of Boston, where I live, the landings are killer. You can't get a refrigerator around that landing. It's really hard to assess that. We do trip estimates and virtual trips uh, with people to like measure it out for people, but still you're gonna do, you know, maybe it's gas versus electric on a dryer. We're still gonna get it wrong a couple of times a day. And all those couple of times a day products come back to outlet. Now, these guys have a list of names of people to call that say, I'm looking for a washer. I'm looking for a dryer. I'm looking for a stove. I'm looking for this. And what they'll call those people. See all those products that this picture was taken a week ago. None of them are in outlet now. So really, if I was, a, if I was looking for appliance, I would certainly call these guys, but I would call all the major box stores, um, all the major independents. There's 60 appliance stores in a 20 mile radius um, in Boston. Someone is gonna have something that you're looking at by just saying, if you have a return, give me a call. Very simple, very effective, but it works. Um, and it's something you should consider. You probably get a, a, a better deal than you're looking for as well. 
Okay, one word of caution. I keep hearing this and it's just like, it, it gives me pause. Someone will say, well, I bought it online and I added it to the cart and I'm gonna expect to deliver that. No, that's not what happens. Um, I think a lot of retailers are getting smarter uh, about saying of estimated lead times, especially the box stores. They're, they're gonna give the estimated lead times right on there. But there's a fair amount of people that are, let's just say over optimistic about when you could expect your clients. So I wouldn't believe any of that until it's until the truck is in your driveway and the, in the, in the stove and refrigerator and the kitchens in your house. So just be very careful. Buy with a credit card that you can cancel at any time. Just be, just be careful. Again, I always say, um, you know, shop store by uh, reputation as well. Just make sure that whoever says they can do something can actually do it. So here are your takeaways. Best takeaway, if you don't need it for a year, if you don't need it for a year and a half, one year isn't gonna much matter. This is something I put, the next one I put in on everyone's webinars, research thoroughly, brands, stores, um, appliances, different appliance brands, just plenty of stuff on the internet, whether it's, whether it's our site or, or some of the other ones. Um, spend a lot of time researching. Stick with available brands if you can. If, we, if we're starting getting from like, the best possible scenario, which is not needing it until they, we have it. But now if you need it before I have it, stick with, before we have it, stick with available brands. There's a lot of good ones that I think um, will be just fine, really. So your brand loyalty is, uh, um, I think, in some cases, uh, might cost you uh, um, a completed kitchen. Look at different model numbers, different feature packages when you, if you need something right now. Also, I would say assess what it is you need and what brands can, can satisfy that need and go with those brands. Scour outlets and cancellations uh, for, for returns. And that is my advice to how to buy during a supply crisis. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. That's oh, what I'm that's our Halloween. I don't know how I became the sheriff and you became the Flash. This is our Halloween. In case you're reading this, uh, Halloween's going to be Thursday, not to date this webinar, but uh, <laughs> that's me. That's the Flash. Pat Palingo is our CMO. Uh, Shannon Stoner is the, uh, I think that's the bad witch. She, uh, she developed the PowerPoint, does a lot of the videos. And of course, the good witch, Saba, Saba, uh, you know, who can tell you anything about cooking. The reigning uh, chopped grand champion, no less. So any cooking questions you have, she does this stuff all day. So uh, she's an excellent resource for that. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Perfect. We'll, uh, we'll start the Q&A now. Um, just to reminder, everybody use the Q&A feature in Zoom here to send us any questions on your mind um, or about that presentation. We can start with some of the questions that were submitted during registration. Um, and we can uh, start tackling these. Um, first one, first one, Steve, um, best way to ensure, this is a question submitted, best way to ensure we're supporting American manufacturers? That's a great question. We wrote a blog post about it. Um, it took me a long time to write it because what are we considering American? Well, first of all, there's a lot of American manufacturers uh, because we typically, uh, use bigger appliances, um, the Europeans and, and, and you know, the Asian countries don't have similar appliances. They're not really in that business. Now Samsung and LG are. But most of your, uh, the bigger one, the biggest one obviously is Whirlpool. Whirlpool is uh, American based out of Ben, ben Harbor, uh, Michigan. Uh, Sub-Zero is based out of Wisconsin. Uh, True is based out of uh, Missouri. Blue Star is based out of Pennsylvania. Um, I think Lynx, still makes all their grills out of um, California with the exception of Sedona, which is imported. Kalamazoo, uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan, I think, or is it Battle Creek? Now Battle Creek is uh, you know, the cereal company, sorry about that. Let's see, am I missing anybody? Then you have, um, if I'm missing somebody, then I'll, I'll add, we'll add this to the webinar. Then you have kind of like the quasi-American companies, the ones that have exclusive American manufacturing but um, are owned by foreign companies. Like Bosch operates the largest dishwasher manufacturing plant in the world, 
out of um, New Bern, North Carolina. They also operate Thermidor, which has significant um, manufacturing capabilities out of um, you know, California and other places. You have Electrolux, which is based in Sweden. A lot of their laundry, all their laundry products are based in Mexico, but they've got significant uh, American manufacturing, especially with their Frigidaire line. You have uh, LG and Samsung, which are mostly foreign, but are now building significant plants in South Carolina and Tennessee. Sharp has been building microwaves since I visited a factory there in 1986. Um, who else am I thinking about? The only real pure play, kind of like foreign company, uh, is Milo, which is design, manufacture. They design, manufacture all their parts, everything out of one plant in Gutschlau, Germany. It is family, you know, we have a soft spot for them a little bit because they are family owned and operated as well. But most everything is either American or what I would consider quasi-American. Um, once again, you know, GE is very interesting because they were bought by higher, you know, hires from uh, China, but they have significant American manufacturing. I mean, that's why they bought them with the exception of their uh, washing machines made in China, dryers are made in uh, the United States. That should cover it. I think. Yep, and like Steve mentioned, we, we do have an article on our blog, uh, diving into that one. Um, next up, let's switch to cooking, maybe get Saba involved here. Um, question about steam ovens. Would you buy a steam oven or stick with a regular microwave? What's the consideration? Um, yeah, this, <laughs> this is a question that we do get asked often. and. The best way to break it down is um, to really look at your cooking style. Uh, microwaves definitely serve a purpose. And if you have a fast paced lifestyle and you find yourself reheating a lot of food and need it quickly for perhaps younger children or you know, you just don't have time to cook. I get it. The microwave makes sense. It's also um, going to be the best way to reheat liquids and pop popcorn. Uh, a steam oven does require a few extra steps in the kitchen, but you get a lot more out of it. There's a lot more nutritional value in your food. You have more versatility and cooking options. You'll be able to not only steam, but use your combination of convection and steam for leaner proteins to inject moisture there. Um, where they might tend to dry out in conventional ovens, um, along with baking breads and reheating uh, foods such as lasagnas or even pizza uh, work great in that mode. And then you have it as a smaller convection oven. So there's a lot more cooking options you're going to get with a combi steam oven versus a microwave. And of course, I could talk about this topic all day long. So if you want to ask specific questions, um, I'm happy to answer them via phone or email, but um, overall it really does come down to your cooking style. But I can say that the steam oven is my favorite appliance. <laughs> Great, thanks, Saba. Um, question about laundry. Somebody's considering a uh, 24 inch compact washer and dryer. Um, well, so what's the consideration there when choosing a compact style and maybe include availability concerns there? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, compact laundry is, is, is bought based on how you dry, which is really odd, I know. But first question to ask is, are you going ventless or are you venting out? If you're venting out, then you don't have much of a choice. It's either Becca or Samsung. They're the only two that make it. Um, evidently, you all had a tips about 10 years ago and, and said you had to keep a, a fire enclosed for however many hours it was and only two companies could do one. So that's the first question. If you're talking about what features you should look at, typically the, the, the two companies that dominate this, uh, this realm is, is Milo, which has a really probably the most sophisticated appliance you could buy is their top end um, compact washer. It's got Wi-Fi, it's got an automatic dispenser to it. It's got the dryer has a place where you can add custom scents to it. It's a 110 heat pump. Heat pump is different from a regular condensing dry because heat pump is, uses a compressor, stores the heat, much more gentle in your clothes, much more energy, energy efficient. Um, and it's 110, it's the only one of its kind. Bosch has got very good, very good, reliable laundry. They have a 220 heat pump. 
um, it really comes down to options and, and, and features of what you're looking for beyond that, really. Um, if you're looking for something inexpensive and reliable, Becco's got some really, you know, they've had it with Blomberg and Becco. Um, they've done a really nice job with compact laundry. Samsung has really good uh, vented and they have a heat pump if you can get it. I know LG has some, you know, that's not their thing per se, but they have compact laundry. Uh, but really what it comes down to is how are you drying? And what features do you want? Um, do you want Wi-Fi connectivity? What kind of cycles do you want? You want an automatic dispenser, which you should because it dispenses the right amount of detergent at the right period of time. So you get better cleaning and the fact that you're not overloading, which is the number one repair we look at in, um, in washers is uh, people putting too much uh, um, soap in and that soap stays in the washer and it becomes a service call. So really depends. And again, we can, uh, I would encourage you, we have a, a uh, a few articles on best compact laundry, and then we do some care and comparisons between them all that you should look at. Thanks, Steve. Um, Saba, another cooking question for you here. Um, when comparing induction cooking and pro gas cooking, which, which is your preference and maybe talk about some of the differences? Sure. So um, there are a few different pro gas options available. You get pro gas ranges, cooktops, and range tops. So obviously, the higher BTUs are going to come in a pro gas range. So when you're comparing that to a induction cooktop, I have to say, you know, even with the higher BTU output, if you're looking for high temperature searing and quick boiling, the induction does have it beat. You get more precision and control with the induction as well. Um, and it's a lot easier to clean. You don't have all the nooks and crannies and, um, you know, the cast iron grates and the surface to clean. It's just one continuous surface. So it's going to be a lot easier to clean your induction cooktop. Now, if you are the type of person that cooks volume a lot at home, meaning you're searing on one burner, doing high, you know, high temperature cooking cooking, wok cooking, uh, boiling, all at the same time where you might be using four or five burners at their maximum capacity, I would say induction is probably not the best option for you because at the end of the day, it is um, a piece of technology. And if you overheat anything with, you know, electrical currents going through it, in the worst case scenario, it does have to cool down. So it may shut down in order to cool down. It's not going to be a workhorse like a gas range. So it comes again down to your cooking style. If you just do some searing, sauteing, um, boiling some water for pasta, you know, if you're using two to three burners at moderate temperatures or five burners at moderate temperatures all at the same time, it'll definitely um, be a great solution for you. But if you need a workhorse, then gas is the way to go. Thanks, Ava. We had a we had a question from the uh, from the attendees here. Um, I have compact laundry with gas drying. Uh, I understand for the most part that's no longer widely available. So how do you coordinate ordering the new appliances and getting the getting workers in to close the gas line and install new electric. Steve, do you wanna talk through that process a little bit? Yeah, um, trying to think of a compact laundry that was gas. Uh, let me guess, um, Gibson Frigidaire. That's the only compact and that's 27 inches wide. That's the only thing I think was, um, was gas. So first of all, measure. Now there's two things you need. Obviously uh, you, you may, in, it depends what state you're in. In the state of Massachusetts, you need a plumber to, to close, the, to touch a gas line. I think that's Massachusetts, and I think that's Rhode Island as well. Um, and I think California, or, or you can do it, or, but no unskilled, no technically unskilled trade. It's probably not that difficult. So you may need a plumber, but really what you really need, um, once again, is you have to answer the venting question, and you also have to answer, um, you may need an electrician in there um, because ga a gas is a 110 line. Electrician is, um, is uh, 220. The difference in amp is 12 versus say 40. 
So you need to make sure you have the available amperage in your box. You need to run a, um, you need to probably run a line and you'll need to run, uh, you'll need to put in an outlet as well, um, by and large. Now that's what you'll have to do. Definitely. I may be missing something. Okay, so venting, plumbing, electrical. That's 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 what you need. Uh, again, the easiest part is venting because a lot of the the better, a lot of the, the, the washers and dryers when they're available uh, are, are ventless. So, but if you want to um, you know, if you want to um, email me directly or send me a picture of what you have. Um, I can certainly get our, our, our install guys to, to look more specifically, but I think I pretty much have it right. That's the only thing that, could, that it could be uh, because everything that you're getting in compact now is smaller than that frigid air. So. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, Ian, Ian uh, who submitted this question, when you get the recording email from us, um, feel free to reply to that. We can, we can dig into that a little bit more. Um, next up, let's go information on microwaves, um, especially drawer microwaves. Um, we, that's a common question. It seems uh, Saba, maybe do you wanna, um, Steve, you wanna start on that one? And maybe Saba, you wanna touch on how those are, might be used differently? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start and, and Saba can answer. I, I have a drawer microwave and I just wrote, uh, I'm, I'm not stepping on your toes here, but I just wrote the, the article on it. All microwave drawers are made in the same place. Sharp makes them for everybody. That's not to say you should buy a Sharp microwave, interestingly enough. Sharp makes the best one for themselves that has convection to it, and Saba can talk about that. They also make the second best one where you can wave in front of it and it opens automatically, which I didn't think was a big deal, but somebody mentioned that when you have your hands full, it might be a good idea. After that, there's two microwaves that you want to look at. Beko, which makes the least expensive of the drawer, my regular drawer microwaves. All you want to do after that is make sure it's flush mounted because it just looks better. That goes flush mounted and it's got a five year warranty and it's less expensive. Say the Beko is 1349. It's the same sharp microwave the kitchen ain't is at 1699. So it makes no sense. And Beko is smart. It's a pretty smart company. They didn't put any, they didn't put any like logos on it that would, that would contrast with anything that you're buying in that visual. <laughs> I thought that was smart. Um, but after that, there's something you can do, like these one, two free rebates where you have $13.99, like Thermador has it, Genier has it, and, and typically they kind of overinflate their dishwasher a little bit. They say it's $13.99. It's really not. I put the $13.99 towards a microwave drawer. So you get a microwave drawer, it's say 400 bucks, and then you can buy a less expensive dishwasher. And those are the four microwaves you consider. Sharp at the top end. Beko, or whenever you're listening to this, if this is today or if it's next year, whatever the least expensive that can be flush mounted, today it's Beko, tomorrow could be some other brand. That's what you should consider. And then consider putting the one, two free rebates onto, uh, onto the way micro dry you want for 400 bucks. Saab, do you want to touch on maybe how um... Any considerations in using a draw microwave compared to a normal a standard microwave? Uh, absolutely. So with a drawer microwave, um, the first question that typically comes up is about the height of it. Um, you're not going to get the same height as you would in um, a standard microwave with the drawer. But for most of my testing purposes, it's definitely been sufficient. So it really comes down to what are you using that microwave for? Are you using it to defrost things, um, reheat things? Do you have a lot of tall containers that you put your food into um, uh, when you're freezing it to defrost it in there? So for most standard things, a dinner plate of food or um, you know, a 24 ounce deli container, it is sufficient. But if you find you're freezing a lot of uh, items in larger containers or higher sort of volume things, then it might not be the, the best solution for you. Um, it's also not a turntable style microwave. Um, I believe it's more of that inverter technology. So, um, I mean, it's still, uh, you know, does a great job, which gives you a lot of options. You can melt and soften and, um, you know, a lot more than you can just with just 
standard power options on um, more traditional microwaves. So there's, there's a lot of pros and cons to both. I would say it just comes down to what you're putting your food in to um, heat it up or to defrost it, so. Thanks, Ava. Uh, just a reminder, use the Q&A if there's any questions that have popped up along the way. Um, another one uh, focused on cooking. Um, someone's uh, researching a 30 inch electric or induction convection stove. Uh, what might be some of the, what might be some of the decision there choosing between electric or induction? Um, so I guess, um, yeah, if you're trying to decide between electric and induction, then uh, I'm going to steer anybody towards induction. Um, it's also going to be electrical powered, but you get a lot more out of an induction um, cooking surface than you do out of electric. Electric is going to be um, not as precise. It's definitely um, a little dangerous, uh, to be honest. The surface itself gets extremely hot. And um, also for any uh, spillovers or boilovers, the food will adhere to the surface of an electric cooktop because of that direct heat. It's going to um, sort of, um, yeah, it'll either overly uh, caramelize it or burn it. And then you get a lot of residual oils and grease on top. Whereas on an induction surface, it's an indirect heat. So it's just residual heat that is on the actual surface. So you don't find a lot of food necessarily sticking to it. Um, we tend to just uh, wipe it down very easily. And you can also put either a silicone mat or a piece of parchment paper down on top of your induction cooktop and cook through there, um, which also makes your cleanup a lot easier. So there's a lot of benefits when you're using induction over uh, an electric uh, range or uh, cooktop. Thanks, Abba. Um, one, um, a couple of questions about appliance availability, um, related to the topic today. Um, these were touched on a little bit in the presentation, I think, but maybe just address them head on here. If I, so if I won't be ready for appliances until April, what's your best, what's the best strategy? Should I rent a storage unit and stockpile appliances? Um, Steve, you want to take that one? <laughs> I probably should. Um, well, here's the good news. Um, the good news is that probably a lot of stuff that you're picking won't be available for six months. And, and, and hopefully um, at that time, by the time you need it, the appliances will be coming in. So you want to delay it as much as you can, but at, at a certain point in time, the store is going to say, look, you need to take delivery of this stuff. So you need to have it on site, like a garage. I wouldn't rent a unit. The damage rate on appliances is, 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 is it's, it's much bigger than it should be, even when you're careful. So really what you wanna do, the best case scenario is, is them getting the appliances at the exact moment when you need it. And what happens is then they ship it to your house, they put it in place and everything goes great, right? Which is probably not gonna happen. The second best is when you have a garage or something on premises, and then you're, you're able to have the contractors or something move it in, or you're able to move in some of the heavier stuff and leave it in your kitchen. Um, but the one thing that you should never ever do is leave appliances crated. Um, I know that sounds kind of strange, but the moment you sign off on appliances, especially if you buy it from internet people and can look at reviews and all the rest of it. And I encourage you, whether it's me or anybody else, you should be looking at the way you're going to be treated by looking at the way people have been treated. I, I honestly believe that is have them uncreated and inspect for damage right there. And you can always just put the box back on, but you always want to inspect your appliances. You know, if it's like, if it's something on the side in, of a refrigerator and the refrigerator is going through new cabinets, it's nothing to worry about as long as it doesn't affect the operation of the appliance, but but really inspect them. But given that is, I, I would really 
prefer you not to um, store it, to get a, a special unit in a remote place that you've got to re-deliver your appliances to your home and then bring them to the kitchen. Uh, best, best scenario is if they come in exactly and able to ship right into your kitchen, but the second best scenario is garage. I mean, if you got to rent something, I guess you got to rent something for that. I, I would shop on that basis of saying, can you hold it till then? And a lot of people can't, but maybe you're buying stuff that's got like a four month lead time and you need a couple extra months. That's certainly a worth the conversation. Thanks, Steve. Um, another question about induction ranges. Um, what do you think about the availability of 30 inch induction ranges in the, in the three to $4,000 price range? Do you like the Beko or what would your choice be that's available in six months or less? Well, I have to remind myself what is available. I, I, I think Becco is available. I think LG is available. Um, God, Samsung, let's see what's not available. Samsung's not available. I think G is available. I like the Becco because it's got, um, it, you know, it's, and, and we just did a, a, a blog post on it. If you look at it, it's, um, you know, it's how many burners are there, power burners on, on there. And I think Becco has two. LG has two. SKS is another good one you might want to consider. They, I think they, they have two of the more powerful ones. Um, I, I would say G, Beko, or uh, only because for availability, G, Beko, LG. Those are the only ones I know that are available. The KitchenAid, you know, the KitchenAid Gen Air, which is the same thing. That's an interesting range to consider because um, that oven below is a baking drawer, so you have a lot of space to actually bake. Uh, between the main oven and the bottom oven. But, but I like the Beko with the controls on the face because you got more space in the top and a good amount of space below as well. So, you know, I'd have to see what's available now. It almost changes, you know, monthly. So those are three options you should get pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, and, uh, that question came in about Beko. Um, is Beko reliable? Do you want to talk about the brand and? Yeah. You know, first of all, um, there's there's two things I don't like um, that are brought to me all the time: new products and new companies. Um, you may notice that we have the smallest amount of, of available brands of all my of, of all the suppliers you can go is because we can't physically fix 140 brands that, that other stores like us carry. It's not possible. So when we first researched Beko, um, they became a good alternate. But we've been watching that reliability because there's nothing, it's not in our best interest to, to sell you something available if it's going to break. You're going to get mad and you're going to be mad at us, rightfully so. And we're going to own the liability of fixing it, which by the way is sending a guy out to fix a range costs more than I, we actually get compensated for. So, but, but Beko is, is, is exactly 6.7% on their, um, on a lot of their stuff. I think they're the third or fourth most reliable brand, well below um, the 9.97% that most, that the average is. They're, I wanna say 20 to 30% below. Dishwashers are, dishwashers are more reliable than, than um, the meal is by 0.5%. Um, their stoves, I don't recall, but their refrigerators are at 18%, which is fantastic for a fridge with an ice maker. Um, so it's been a very reliable line to this point for us. And I think we just um, wrote an article, uh, I want to say last week, about whether you should buy Beko or Blomberg, really the same company. And we published the reliability statistics right on there. Thanks, Steve. Yep, like Steve mentioned, we, we published all those uh, reliability rankings by brand and category on our blog. So that would be a great resource to check out there. Um, a couple more here. Um, Steve, which dishwasher is easiest to get parts and service for in my area? Maybe, um, and maybe talk about how to get, find good service in general. Where's the, what area are we talking about? Uh, it's not local to us, but. Oh, it's not local? We, oh, okay. Um, 
I can only tell you that the, the companies that are easy to get parts from right around here. Sub-Zero does a really good job because they make their own stuff. Good. Mila does a pretty good job. Bosch does a pretty good job. G does a good job. So does Whirlpool. Those are the ones that come to mind, um, to be honest. Really, when, you know, service is universally, how do I say this politely? I would say in the time of Amazon, we're expecting same day, next day type of thing. I think service is about as opposite of that experience as you can get. And the only way that you're going to figure out whether service is good is by checking out the people that do it. And, and here's the problem. The worst, the, there, there are two of the worst jobs in our company right now is service manager and parts manager getting parts for anything is we're, we're, you know, we're 20, we used to be three days out in 2019, three to seven days, out, which is okay. You know, if someone has a, a gas fire or no refrigeration or, or we, we still get out there same day, but our whole kind of mantra has always been, we want to be out there same day, next day for delivery. If you need it or service, you need it. And we're so far removed from that now. And it's depressing, but, it's not so much a human problem because now we have plenty of techs. It's getting the parts problem. We, we just can't get the parts. So I think service is gonna be a challenge. So the best thing you can do is investigate in your area and buy reliable products initially and hope for the best really at this point. I anticipate that we're gonna be much better next year. I already start seeing that happen, but this has been a, uh, this has been a, a brutal, year for us quite honestly one more question um can you talk about availability of um meal dishwashers in the backlog there <laughs> yeah they um they're gonna be you know it, it's funny when you talk to people if i had a guess when all of this is going to shake out when everything is going to be fine you know we're we're running a series uh, that we hope to publish in December. We talked to like, um, we already did our first interview yesterday. The people actually make this stuff. Um, our first interview was with uh, Jim Baki, who's, who runs Sub-Zero. Um, we're gonna talk to Emilio people and everything else. And the question I asked is, when do you expect to come back to normal? And, and the answer I, I, I keep getting is not in 2022. So you're looking at 2023. And I think meal is a particularly hard problem because they have, their first market's Europe, their second market's in the US. So I think they're only manufacturing enough to satisfy existing backlog, I think. Perhaps I'm wrong, but I think you're gonna have a really hard time finding a dishwasher next year. I think, you know, you look at Jenny who did all the right things. If she needed a meal of dishwasher, it was eight months out. So that's what you're looking for in a dishwasher. And the good news is, you know, I, I think, well, I was going to say Bosch. I think the Bosch Crystal Dry is really worth considering. Um, I never would have thought volcanic elements actually dry dishes, but they do. I, I think that Becco at eight ninety nine and the panel one at eleven twenty nine. I think when this all shakes out, I think people are still going to buy that. Um, and I think other, look at other options too, is what I'm saying. Great, Steve. Do you want to... Uh... You want to summarize the kind of the key takeaways from today before we sign off? Yeah, key takeaways is plan ahead. Um, we covered a lot of the stuff in this webinar. Uh, the webinar you want to look at is how to start um, your kitchen with appliances. And just remember, first thing is figure out what you need, right? And and then place it, right? The big consideration obviously is is uh, sink dishwasher, stove top, not stove, but stove top. Now, if that stove, have, if that stove top happens to be on the stove, great. Um, but wall ovens, refrigeration could be anywhere. Now, if you have a larger kitchen, where, does, where do the secondary items go? If it's steam oven, a Saba, a Saba intimated, do you put it over a single oven and maybe put a warm and dry underneath? You get a double oven and maybe put the steam oven somewhere else. Uh, it all depends. Take it, map it, chalk it, and figure out if it's worth it to you. If, if it's zero to six months, as I said, there's some good available brands. If you need it now, call everywhere. 
right? And always, you know, always check reliability, trust, Google reviews, as much as I despise Yelp, it's, it's, a, it's a good resource um, um, for, you to, for you to really figure out how you're gonna be treated after the sale is made, which is really the most part, it's a relationship. It's, it's, it's not just a transaction, especially with some of the brands we're talking about. And that, that's what I would encourage you to do. Um, again, uh, check out the webinar, two webinars, 11 kitchen renovation mistakes. You don't wanna get into like the top three of those and how to start your kitchen, which is gets really, it's hundred percent of um, kitchen design. So those are the two I'd recommend. Great, thank you, Steve and Saba. Be on the thank lookout you. for an email from us uh, with this recording. Uh, we'll also include, we'll include links to those um, webinars that Steve just mentioned. Um, you can find all of our previous webinars on YouTube and all of our articles um, about lots of the topics we talked about today on our blog. Until uh, next time, thank you and see you later.